Okay, this is part three of how to live longer for beginners. And what we're showing here is a test tube of blood. So this is, you know, like your purple top test tube. You've drawn blood for uh, your CVC. The red blood cells sediment out to the bottom. The white blood cells stay in the middle here. It's called the Buffy coat. And the platelets are in there as well. And then the plasma is on top. And the plasma normally is translucent. You could see through it. Now, if you eat a high-fat meal, the uh, plasma component becomes opaque. It's full of like your chylomicrons, for example, the fat. And so you can't see through it anymore. There was a good image of this in the, in the movie called uh, Game Changers about vegan diet for athletes. You probably watched it on the internet somewhere you could find that. Um, so anyways, fat has a visible, causes a visible change in the blood. Fat causes red blood cells to stick together. Here's some numbers you want to know. You want to know that an average red blood cell has got a diameter of about 7 microns. Um, a capillary only has a diameter of about 5 microns. You want to know that. The reason is the red blood cell is bigger than the capillary, so it has to fold back on itself to pass through that capillary. That's important because it means the red blood cell has to be kind of flexible. Um, what happens when you eat a high-fat meal, the chylomicrons and the LDL particles are bridging molecules, meaning they stick the red blood cells together. When they stick them together, now you're trying to push something that's almost like a little bit like a submarine sandwich through these capillaries. The purpose of blood pressure is to get blood to the top of your brain, your cerebral cortex. So if the blood is thick, like a milkshake, you have to pump at a higher pressure than if the blood is thin, like water, so to speak. Uh, so uh, high fat meals, sticking the red blood cells together, is called blood sludge, also called rouleau formation. Rouleau means stack of coins in French, is going to lead to higher blood pressure. The main thing that causes higher blood pressure is eating high fat diets, okay? There's other things that do it too. I'll come to that in just a moment. Red blood cells, all blood cells as a matter of fact, they've got a zeta potential. A zeta potential means a negative charge on their outer surface. Doctors don't know this. I've never met a doctor in my life who knows this. but And I didn't learn this either in med school or residency or fellowship. But it's very important to know. It's very basic. You have to know this. Negative charge on the outer surface of red blood cells. And that causes them to repel from each other so they don't stick together. That's good. You don't want them sticking together. A bridging molecule is a molecule with a positive charge that sticks the red blood cell together. That's called overcoming the zeta potential. What does that? Chylomicrons will do that. LDL cholesterol does that. IgM antibodies, those are the antibodies that come up in an acute infection. That's why acute infection can cause uh, thrombosis of a blood vessel. Um, fibrinogen is the clotting protein that's also elevated in an acute stressful situation. It's acute phase reactant released by the liver. Um, there's also uh, bacterial endotoxins that are elevated in the blood with leaky gut. LPS from gram-negative bacteria, LTA from gram-positive bacteria, and they will cause fibrinogen to become activated actually in a, in a bad way, amyloidogenic clotting. They'll change its shape from alpha helix, which is like, like a slinky, like a cylinder, to beta pleated sheet, which is flat, so they can stack up on each other. Um, that's a secondary protein structure. And they'll form a type of clot that's refractory to lysis, refractory to being dissolved. So they're called dense matted deposits. Again, this is the work of Douglas Kell and Atheresia Pretorius. Um, uric acid will do it too. You get elevated blood uric acid from eating meat. You also get elevated blood uric acid from eating an excessive amount of fructose, like a high fructose corn syrup. That can do it as well. It's both a bridging molecule and it also is an inhibitor of endothelial nitric oxide synthase, the vasodilator synthesizing enzyme. So when you decrease nitric oxide, you won't get as much vasodilation. That's bad. Okay, so you'll get thick blood and constricted vessels. That's bad. So dietary sodium also causes inhibition of endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So you'll get, again, constricted vessels. So it's harder to pump blood up to the brain if the blood vessels are narrowed, constricted, um, and you're pumping thick blood. So it's a double screw job. So that will also cause hypertension. The thicker the blood, blood thickness is also called blood viscosity. The higher LDL cholesterol, the higher blood viscosity. Okay. Uh, higher total cholesterol is associated with higher LDL cholesterol, so it's bad. That's why it's the risk factor for atherosclerosis, that it is. Atherosclerosis, by the way, is a blood clot. And the reason doctors don't know that is they get trained in knowing about cholesterol, but not much more than that. I can tell you it's a blood clot. I did a fellowship at Harvard with the emphasis on vascular disease, and I didn't even learn this at that time, but I've been interested in atherosclerosis for about 30 years. And... What I've learned subsequent to that is the best authors on atherosclerosis are the pathologists because they look at it under a microscope. 
Surgeons want everything in the world to revolve around surgery. Cardiologists want everything in the world to revolve around stents. And I was an imaging guided surgeon, and I did a lot of lower extremity peripheral vascular work. And, you know, we thought we were the experts on atherosclerosis, but it turns out the pathologists are the real experts. They look at it with a microscope, and they go, oh, atherosclerosis, it's a blood clot. I can tell you, I also look at a lot of CT angiograms, CAT scan angiograms, and atherosclerosis looks the exact same as a blood clot. That's what it is. And it becomes an organized hematoma, if you will, that, it, that the immune system comes in and tries to reabsorb it. Anyways, here's some work done by Peter Quo in the 1950s, and then later Ray Rosenman and Meyer Friedman did similar work in the 1960s showing that when you eat a high-fat meal, the red blood cells stick together. They measure the blood levels in the patient, the blood lipids, every 30 minutes. And with saturated fat, it would sort of get peak lipemia from about, you know, three to seven hours. And the patients that, that had cardiac angina to begin with that had had the most anginal episodes, especially at peak lipemia, highest levels of fat in the blood, five to six hours. Um, a very daring thing to do, this experiment, and this was done by Peter Quo, a cardiologist back in the 1950s when they didn't have, uh, you know, coronary artery uh, angiography, angioplasty, or stenting back in those days. Um, anyways, this just showed that's when you get maximum uh, occlusion of vessels and maximum symptoms of cardiac angina. They later thought maybe things would be better if they tried with the omega-6 uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, the cooking oils in the 1960s, but they were even worse, caused more prolonged, more prolonged sludging of the blood, more prolonged uh, symptomatic uh, lipemia. And they, even the research techs were pissed off that the patients maintained persistent high levels of blood lipids for so long they wanted to go home, okay, it was screwing up their day. So the point I'm making is you can't win with these fats. You're screwed with the saturated fats and the original coral work. You're screwed with the uh, omega-6 fats, and you're screwed with omega-3s too because omega-3s, even though they're more bent and in such a way that you get less initial uh, like triglycerides and they initially have a slightly antithrombotic effect, in the long run, all fat, you know, the fat you eat the fat you wear, like Dr. McDougall says, and they push towards obesity, they push towards insulin resistance, insulin resistance push towards vasculopathy, vascular disease, and so you end up not being able to win that game as well. Plus, the omega-3 suppress the immune system. They're a bad idea, in my opinion, and based on the research. And, you know, Dr. McDougall agrees with that. Uh, Nathan Pritikin agrees with that. Fat is bad. All dietary fats, if you eat them in excessive amounts beyond just what you get from low-fat plant foods, they have a negative effect on vascular health. And one of the points I wanted to make was you got tons of patients that are short of breath. Here's the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve, and it's sigmoidal, meaning shaped like a letter S, and it's got a relatively flat part over here. So a healthy person at rest isn't going to notice a 20% drop in arterial PO2 pressure of oxygen because there's so much reserve, okay? But once they're exercising, it can have a significant effect on their athletic performance. And you got a lot of people with you know, lousy lung function due to previously smoking cigarettes, COPD, or as they call them, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, bronchitis, or poor, poor pulmonary function for other reasons, pulmonary fibrosis, or other less common conditions. Okay, so what I'm saying is all doctors should know this. A quick way to be able to increase arterial PO2 by as much as 20%. Wouldn't you want to know that? Here's some of the papers that document this. The Friedman paper in circulation, 1964. And there's also Peter Quo papers. In my longer lectures on atherosclerosis, I go into all these in more detail. But I'm saying all doctors ought to know this, and they don't. Ray, Ray Swank showed you could drop oxygen delivery to the brain tissue in a hamster by 35% by feeding high-fat meals. Okay, so it's a big deal. Douglas Kell is a guy who did a lot of that research on uh, postprandial endotoxemia. Etheresia Kell also worked with him. She's the lady PhD from South Africa. So this is where you find all this information. Pretty useful to know. One of the main reasons people age is they plug up their arteries with atherosclerosis. And then, you know, everything works good in the body better when it's got good blood flow. All right, so anyways, this is like Dr. McDougall's work on going through the literature on cancer, and what he basically showed is a doubling time. Let's say on average it's about 100 days for a cancer cell. It takes a long time doubling at that rate as it typically does, 10 years before it gets to be about a centimeter in size and it's detectable. Okay, and the point is by that time it's usually metastasized somewhere else, and that's why he thinks local therapies for cancer are not that useful. That systemic therapy is most important. And the most systemic thing in the world is optimizing your diet 
and your sleep and your lifestyle, which you can do, you know, 24-7 around the clock. You know, you can give chemo, which systemically goes throughout the body, but it only can be given short amounts of time before it becomes too toxic. That's the limiting variable, and there's a lot of side effects. Nothing but positive side effects from eating a low-fat vegan diet with no oil, getting your sleep and stuff like that. Okay, and again, the typical patient, you know, they think that going to the hospital is going like on a field trip. Here's a, you know, pilgrimage to Canterbury Cathedral by Paul Hardy. Okay, and so what I'm saying is when you, you don't cure a disease by taking a picture of it. When you take a picture of a disease, all you've done is take a picture of it because, you know, patients, they love to go for CAT scans, for blood tests, for colonoscopies, you know, all this stuff. But what I'm saying is you don't cure a disease by taking a picture of it. You can have some therapeutic benefit from uh, colonoscopy, removing a, a polyp, but, you know, a lot better to prevent the polyp by eating low-fat vegan. Plenty of people have had polyps, and they've gone away when they go low-fat vegan. I can tell you, when I went to, I had a colonoscopy because my mother died of colon cancer, and uh, the gastroenterologist looked at my colon, and he goes, your, your colon is so normal, it's not even funny, is what he told me. You know, I'm not scared of disease. You know, I might piss somebody off, big farmer, and they kill me, but I'm not scared of diseases, okay? Um, the good news is you can really do a lot to prevent the stuff. You also got to pay attention to toxicology because there's more and more toxins in the food and the water and the air these days, so you want to avoid those as best you can. And you learn about them, you know what to avoid, okay? You know, if you're walking down the street and a car starts coming towards you, you go, uh-oh, and you jump out of the way, okay? But if the car is invisible, how do you get out of the way? For most people, they're ignorant of all this stuff, so they don't know how to get better because they don't know what to do. Uh, we talked about the bridging molecules sticking the red blood cells together, causing hypertension, got to pump a higher pressure. Uh, normal blood flow should be laminar, meaning the red blood cells are in the center, the white blood cells are on the periphery, and then the plasma is right here. So this would be red blood cells in red. WBCs would be in blue. And then the plasma would be on the outer part of the flow. That's called laminar flow, a parabolic uh, blood velocity profile. That creates healthy blood vessels. If you have too much high blood pressure, it bounces against the median divider or the bifurcation. Like let's say this is going up to the brain. You got the internal carotid inside going up to the brain. You got the external carotid going to the face with the branches on it. When the pressure of the blood is too high and it hits at a median divider, it bounces off of that, causing retrograde flow, also causing turbulent flow. Chaotic flow is turbulent flow. If there's too much of that because the pressure is too high, the Blood vessel lining cells, endothelium it's called, will sense that as a vascular injury. It'll shed the antithrombotic glycocalyx, its lining, and it'll express prothrombotic molecules, and you'll form blood clots on the wall of the artery. Now, this will be in a steady state, but if you do more prothrombotic things, like you've got leaky gut, etc., you've got an active infection, etc., this clot will grow bigger and bigger, and eventually little pieces might break off, go to the brain, and cause strokes. Okay, so you don't want that. You want your blood thin so you don't form these clots in the first place. That's the best way to be. Okay, a little bit about psychological stress. Psychological stress is an adaptive response to acute physical danger that should only last, let's say, anywhere from five minutes to an hour or so. You know, the, the metaphor that you learn in med school and physiology class is being chased by a tiger in the dark. Okay, so we are basically a primarily plant-eating animal, a herbivorous animal in a sense, and... You know, we sense there's a big predator animal coming towards us. We're going to try to climb a tree or something, pick up a stick, you know, be able to fight it off, whatever it takes. So your brain's constantly deciding, is everything cool? Can I stay in parasympathetic, autonomic physiology, rest and digest, feed and breathe? That's what we want to be in. Peaceful, calm, enjoying our time with our extended friends and family, eating our plant foods, okay? Um, but if we sense danger, we go, uh-oh. Here comes a pack of hyenas. I better be ready to fight or to run, pick up a stick. Okay, stay away from me. All right, so anyways, so your brain's constantly making that assessment. Are things cool or not cool? Cool or not cool? Cool or not cool? Most of the time, things are cool. You can just do whatever you're doing. Enjoy reading your book. Enjoy eating your bananas. Everything's fine, but your brain is always making that assessment. And when it senses danger, it sends fight or flight hormones. Your cortisol and catecholamines come out to ramp up your blood lipids, your blood glucose, so you can be ready for fight, flight, or whatever you have to do. I mention this because it has a big effect on your physiology, and your brain constantly wants to answer this question all day long because it's what you need to stay alive. Things are not okay, you go into sympathetic mode. In sympathetic mode, the body has limited resources, so it's, it shuts off 
everything that's not essential to survive. So you don't need an immune system. You're not worried about an infection when you're running from, you know, being chased by a tiger in the dark, okay? All you're worried about is, can I climb this tree, climb this wall, you know, hit it with this stick and try to survive? So that's not at all like parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is, oh, I'm gonna enjoy this lovely dinner. I'm gonna take a nice nap. I love this wonderful woman. We're gonna go for a walk holding hands on the beach. Everything is cool, all right? So you wanna spend as much of your life as you can, and this is PANS, means parasympathetic autonomic nervous system phase in you know, contradiction to sympathetic autonomic nervous system phase, and that is sympathetic, SANS, all right? So, you know, we do need a little bit of stress. This is called the yerkes dodson uh, curve of performance. I'll take myself off here if you wanna get a print screen on this. So basically, you need enough stress that you're energized, you're motivated, you wanna jump out of the bed in the morning and do something good and useful, whatever it is. If you're a runner, you wanna run and get some exercise. If you're a scholar, you wanna study. Whatever it is, whatever you do for your job, your, your life, you do it. And you need a little bit of motivation to energize you. That's all good. If you're too excessively stressed out, then you could potentially have anxiety or uh, panic and you choke in a sport. So you don't want that, that impairs performance. But you need some stress, some motivation, otherwise you just wanna go back to sleep, all right? That's the yerkes dachshund curve of trying to optimize your stress. Now here's a little bit about social. This is the Rosetto effect. And the Rosetto is a town in Italy where these multi-generation Italian families live together with grandpa and grandma and the other grandpa and grandma, the grandchildren, the children, and they all lived together and helped each other out. And they were much, much healthier than the people who were demographically matched to them. So these extended families, you know, if Luigi loses his job and he's living by himself in the city, he's screwed. He can't pay his rent. He can't buy food. He could starve to death. He's homeless. He's screwed, okay? On the other hand, if Luigi, living with the extended family, the Rosetto effect, he loses his job, it's not a big deal. He'll just go look for another job. The rest of the family will feed him, take care of him, shelter him until he finds a new job. So they were very healthy. Then in the 19th family, 1970s, families in America spread apart so much. There were a lot more no-fault divorces, and these extended families all broke apart. And once they broke apart, the these Italian families were no longer any healthier than their neighbors, okay? But when they were all working together as an extended family, they were much healthier. So there's a lot of benefits to having a good social support system. Here's a nice painting called Filial Piety and the paralytic. So this poor old guy, he's you know a paraplegic, but he stays alive because the family helps him out. They feed him, they love him, they take care of him. So there's a big advantage to uh, having social support in life. So you wanna try to maintain your relationships. You know, you try to maintain your relationships. Be nice to people and they'll be nice to you. Okay, so that's the end of uh, part three of um, this uh, video on how to live longer for beginners.